uh, today, as I was thinking about uh, this teaching and then uh, getting into colleges has been in the news uh, this week, uh, I was thinking of some college stories. Actually, a couple weeks ago, I was telling a group of friends various uh, college stories, many of which are uh, NSFS, not safe for Sunday. Uh, so I'll tell one that was uh, Cliff and I. Cliff is one of our sound guys and been here since the beginning of the church. Cliff and I were roommates and got into a lot of trouble. We both thank God that you YouTube didn't exist or neither one of us would be in any form of ministry, uh, maybe not free uh, outside of jail. Uh, but we were very mischievous in college, doing lots of funny things. And um, we had these friends that lived two dorms down, Dan and his roommate, Dan. It was very confusing. Uh, so Dan and Dan lived in this dorm, and we were always dreaming up ways just to uh, play tricks on them. So I don't know where I got this idea, but I pulled out a record album, uh, which I don't have to explain that anymore because those have come back and they're popular now. But uh, I pulled out a record album and filled it with shaving cream and stuffed it under Dan and Dan's dorm room, a uh, little small room, jumped on the record album, and just like this shaving cream cream bomb went off uh, in their room. They were sitting at their two desks and just got hit with shaving cream shrapnel. And uh, we were always just doing funny things. One time, uh, the um, God bless them, the senior saints at Fairfield Christian Church uh, sent Cliff and I a care package, you know. I had some homemade cookies and chocolates and different things in there, which we were happy. But then, apparently, some person decided to clean out their closet of uh, mackerel because there were just all these cans of mackerel, little salty fish, in spicy honey mustard sauce. We're like 19. I, we're not eating mackerel in spicy honey mustard sauce. What could we do with this? And I can't remember if it was Cliff or I since, I don't know, Cliff, are you here? Good. Okay, I can blame him. I think it was Cliff's idea. And so... Uh, <laughs> I honestly think it was mine. But anyway, uh, we decided this would be a great practical joke. And so there was a gentleman that lived next to us, and we always picked on him. He picked on us. And um, he never quite learned that he should lock his dorm room. And so we went in there, and it was in the middle of winter, and we pulled the cover off the heater and took the mackerel and smeared it all over the heater, put the cover back on, turned the heat on high. and But that wasn't enough. Uh, we opened his refrigerator and there was a nice sandwich he had made and so we took the sandwich apart and hid the mackerel in the sandwich and we weren't friends for a while and I'm not sure why man I'm not kidding you not only did his dorm stink like the whole wing stunk uh, it was bad well anyway uh, I didn't go to a college where you know you had to pay somebody a million dollars to get you in um, nobody photoshopped my face onto a picture as a great athlete uh, that would have taken a lot of work on Photoshop. Uh, but uh, I think I went to a college. Like, if you could pay the tuition, they were glad to have you. And uh, so uh, it was kind of interesting this week, wasn't it? That whole story of, of uh, colleges and, and the ultra-rich paying sometimes up to a million dollars more even to get their kid into a prestigious school. You know, it was an amazing, amazing story. I mean... I mean, most of us have a sense that the ultra-wealthy would have some advantage already, but then I just, like, dug it into many Americans to think through, like, just the amount of, of cheating and, and privilege, and that was, that was an interesting story. And I kind of think it highlighted that, that, you know, there's something wrong in our culture and in our society right now, and I think we all kind of feel that, right? Like we, we have this, this scenario now where it seems like every group, whatever their opinion is, gets blasted all over social media, and then we're entrenching ourselves further and further apart. One side pushes hard, the other side pushes back harder, and then this side pushes hard. Whatever the topic is, whether we're talking politics or social views or whatever, or, or there's one social view that's extreme, which just means we'll create another social view that's more extreme. It's an interesting study recently came out from uh, Pew. Uh, they do a great uh, research, uh, have a great research arm. And it just showed like how polarized we're becoming. So 1994, they just ask a series of statements to Republicans and Democrats and say, do you agree with these statements? And you can see on that one that the median Republican and the median Democrat belief were, were very close. Go to the next slide, please. 
It gets a little further apart, uh, but still fairly close in the middle. Now look at the next slide. Major jump in 10 years, right, of more poll. So the, the average Republican, average Democrat further apart, and then take the latest research they've done, even further apart, and then the, the medium kind of hill on the, you see each hill is further apart and put, uh, farther right, farther left. And now we have this incredible polarized deal where like the work of the people isn't getting done. And, and there just seems to be a lot of angst around that. Albert uh, Brooks, he uh, is at the think tank, the American Enterprise, said, you know what we probably ought to give up for Lent is contempt. <laughs> that we're at this point now that if you don't believe what I believe or if I have a different opinion than you, then I'm going to show you contempt. I'll just slap a label on you and then I don't have to listen to you and we don't have to be friends anymore. That's kind of a sad place we've ended up, right? You know, like there's just something wrong in our society right now. Like there's something in us we know society's wrong, society's broken, and it, it needs fixed. You'd, you'd think that the church would have something to say, and I think the church does, but unfortunately what comes out of, of the church so often are, you know, major failings. I mean, in the last year, two of the most prominent uh, pastors uh, that have been fairly well-respected, have radio shows, books, giant conferences, had huge fallings in the Chicagoland area and just puts a black eye on, on churches and our moral voice. Uh, and, you know, and then the Catholic uh, abuse scandal, I mean, just huge. And, and it's like, okay, it's hard to turn even to the church for answers. And we started this series, The Story of Jesus, and this idea that, that Jesus has come into the world, and that when you see Jesus, you see God. When you receive Jesus, uh, God says that's the way you become a child of God. It's, it's, when you receive Jesus, you actually see who God made you to be. And uh, you become his child, a son and daughter, fully accepted. We sang that in a song today. Um, we learned last week that Jesus comes into the world to kind of to save the world. And yet you hear all this stuff, let alone, you know, I, I started with some funny stuff about college stuff. And it's not funny, especially they took, you know, legitimate people's places in school. But, uh, and then polarization obviously isn't funny. That's, that's a, a lot of angst in our country and just stuff isn't getting done. But I haven't even talked about like other just gigantic problems in the world, the level of violence and uh, that's going on around the world and terrorism and and uh, white supremacy that we learn, you know, is on the rise in, in uh, our country and in places like New Zealand. And major, you know, like, okay, Jesus, if you came, why don't you do something about it? Like, why don't you set everything right? And, and uh, can I be a part of that? Can I be a part of setting things right? And yet, if you're like me and you're honest, you realize that it's easy for, to lob stories and condemnation at polarization and terrorism and brokenness and contempt and easy to do that but man I look in the mirror and I got my own brokenness how about you like I'm not even sure like Jesus if you came and set everything right I'm not sure where I land <laughs> you know if I start calling down fire from heaven and you destroy everything that's evil I might be a crispy critter at the end of it right because I still got some brokenness and evil in me, right? Don't you? So Jesus, can you still use us? Can you, can you even identify with our brokenness? How do we identify? Like I, want, I don't want to just add Jesus to my story. When I read about Jesus in the Bible, I want to join his story. I want to be a part of what he's doing because he's doing it right. He's doing it with love and compassion, but he's doing it with personal transformation in a way that whole cities can be transformed. And I want to be transformed. I want to see my city transformed. And I get the sense that the reason you come to church is that you want that too. You want to be transformed. You want to see your city transformed. So how do we join the story of Jesus? That's what I want to talk about today. If you have your Bibles or if you have a uh, smart device, turn to Matthew chapter 3. And we're going to check out a story when Jesus is kind of first revealed as the Messiah. We get hints of that at his birth, but we don't have much about Jesus from his birth to this event we're going to read about today. In fact, um, uh, two of the books that are about Jesus, Mark and John, they skip the birth story and they just start with this story. 
Um, this is like when Jesus is revealed to be the Savior of the world, the Messiah, and like you know who he is, and it's when his mission on the planet of transforming people and transforming cultures and cities begins. And so we're going to look at that and answer the question, how to join the story. Now, or his story. Now, the world that Jesus steps into is kind of like ours in a way, um, although I would actually say quite worse. Uh, the people of God, called the Jews, they had been overtaken by the Romans uh, about 100 years before this event we're reading about today. Um, the Romans uh, demanded loyalty. They stripped you of your rights. They had complete control of your country and countrymen. They had ruled with an iron grip. And it seemed like the harder they pushed, the harder the, the, the Jews pushed. And there was continually friction and violence in their world. Um, for 400 years, the people of God had not heard a word from God. No new scripture had been written. No prophet had arisen to say God is doing something. Um, and so there was this cry of people wanting more of, of, of God. Um, uh, Don Williams, a uh, vineyard scholar in his book, Start Here, says this. We'll put this quote up here. First century Jews were obsessed by their messianic hope. Their land was occupied by Rome. They cried out for deliverance, the final exodus that would usher in the promised kingdom of God. The harder the Romans pushed, the harder the Jews pushed back. Messianic pretenders came and went as Rome crushed every hint of revolt. The tighter the Romans grip, the more furious and more fanatical the Jews became. This is the world that Jesus steps into. The beginning of the story, which we, we won't read, I'll just summarize for you is Jesus' cousin, a guy named John. We call him John the Baptist. He wasn't called that back then, but it's a label we've put on him because he just baptized people, which was unusual back then. People did not get baptized when John came. Particularly, Jews did not get baptized. Baptism was only for non-Jews who converted to Judaism, and it was a symbol that non-Jews were, were dirty uh, in their mindset and needed washed, and Jews just thought, I don't need washed. I'm already, I'm one of God's people. And so John was calling Jewish people to do something quite extraordinary. He says, you need to repent for the rule and reign of God. God has come back to the planet, and he wants to take back what's his. The rule and reign of God has started. The Savior's already here, and the time of decision is past due, so act now. He's out in the wilderness. He's the first prophet in 400 years, and people, I mean, Tax collectors, prostitutes, religious people, soldiers, every kind of upper class, lower class, everybody in between, they're going out in the desert to see this guy because there's a hope that maybe this is it. Maybe God's moving again. Maybe deliverance is coming. Maybe it's happening now. And so all these people go out and every day they're leaning in, hoping, just hoping, <laughs> maybe today's the day the Savior's revealed. We're going to take a look at how Jesus is revealed and in so doing learn how to join the story of Jesus. Take a look at Matthew chapter 3 and uh, we will begin at verse 11. This is John speaking. This is one of his messages. I baptize you with water for repentance. Repentance is a $10 word that simply means to turn around, change your mind and go all in this direction. And in a spiritual sense, what it means is if you're living your own life, your own way, repentance is turn, change your mind about God and go all in with God and do life the way he would want you to do it. So he's preaching. He says, I preach a baptism of repentance, but after me, one who's more powerful than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry is coming. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn, burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Friendly message. Um, essentially, he's saying, listen, God is coming, and he's separating the people who are going to go after him from those who are. Fire is coming, and, and these people back then, what their anticipation was is God would come back, and he would, he would reward all the right people, and he would punish all the bad people. And the punishment was going to be, fire was going to come and smite thee, burn you up, you know, smite. Uh, you're going to come. So they're anticipating this. And it's kind of a weird scene because there's all these people and they want God to come back and deliver them. Yet at the same time, you've got tax collectors, prostitutes, soldiers who work for the Roman government. They're not sure where they're going to land when the fire comes. But yet there's something drawing them to this message. 
One day, John's cousin Jesus comes down to be baptized. In John chapter 1, verse 29, it says, when John sees him, he goes, behold, the Lamb of God, meaning here's the one that's going to sacrifice himself to set us free. Here's how it says that interaction takes place. Take a look at verse 13. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John, but John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized to you, and do you come to me? Like John recognized all of a sudden, wait a second, this isn't just my cousin. This is God in the flesh. He is pure. He is holy. All these people need to repent because they got some form of brokenness or sin in their life. This guy doesn't. He has no sin. In fact, remember John's message. He said, I'm not even worthy enough to be a sandal-carrying slave for him. I can't even do that. Because he's like here and I'm like here in my own sinfulness. I should be asking you to baptize me. Look at Jesus' reply, verse 15. Let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. Jesus says, this is like the right thing to do. I have to do this. You say, why is it, why is it the right thing to do? Why, why did Jesus have to do this? Jesus didn't need to get baptized because he needed sin washed off of him. He didn't need to repent and turn away from uh, his sin because he had no sin. So it wasn't that he needed to do it to get right with God. So what was right about what he did? I answer that, I'll begin to answer how to join Jesus' story. The reason Jesus got baptized was because he came to identify with your story and my story. The reason it was right for him to get baptized is he didn't come to stand against us. He came to stand with us. Remember, all their anticipation was God's going to show up and fire's coming, buddy. Light them up. And Jesus didn't come that way. Some of you know the most famous verse in the Bible, right? Uh, John 3, 16. Um, For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. The verse right after, it's quite telling. For the son of God did not come into the world to condemn the world but to save the world. Now, he'll come again with judgment, I think, the second coming. He's going to separate right from wrong and take care of all of it in one fell swoop. But he comes the first time to offer grace to anybody who wants it and to not stand against you, but to stand with you. He identifies with us. Remember, he's 100% God, 100% human. And he identifies with our brokenness and with our sin and our temptations. And when he is baptized, it is him saying, I am with you. I am one of you. I'm going to walk this out like you walk it out. I'm going to do life the way you do life. And suffer your betrayals, your sicknesses, your temptations, the brokenness in your world, being misunderstood. I'm going to walk out what you walk out. He joins our story. I think there's another Don Williams slide up here about Jesus standing with us. So let's go to that next slide there. Or maybe before. It's the second Don Williams slide. I will continue. Um, The next thing that happens is Jesus says this. He says... In verse 17, he says, so at that moment, let's take a look at verse 16. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was open, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Heaven had been shut up for 400 years. And at that moment, it opened. And the Holy Spirit touched Jesus. 
Now, the God part of Jesus already had the Holy Spirit because God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit are all God, right? They're the same essence, same nature, same being. They share that. But remember, Jesus is also 100% human. And the human part needed empowered by the Holy Spirit. And it's, it, it's no coincidence that when Jesus receives the Holy Spirit and his human side, that's when his ministry begins, because he's going to do ministry the same way you and I are going to serve people and love people, which is out of the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes, and then his Father God speaks from heaven and says, this is my son. He's divine. I'm for him, and I'm well pleased with him. I approve of his message and his mission. Then from that moment on, Jesus preached his message and did his mission on the planet. Because he was empowered by the Holy Spirit. We started by just asking a simple question. How do we identify with Jesus' story? And would he even want us to identify with his story? You know, Because we're broken and we're misfits and could even use us to help change the world. I mean, we got to get transformed ourselves and then in hopes of transforming the world. But can that ever happen? And So here's the deal. Jesus identifies with your story so that you can join his story. It's so you can be a part of what he's doing on the planet, but it had to start with him identifying with us, living our life, and then he lives it perfectly as an example for us. And it's so perfect, no sin, that he ends his life by, at least his life on the planet, by dying on a cross to pay for the sins he didn't owe, he paid for the sins that we owe. And then he rises from the dead, saying, I'm bigger than sin and death and disease. And then he pours out his spirit, just like God poured it out on him. When we receive Christ, we receive the presence of God and so that we can live for Jesus and be personally transformed and then hopefully transform our families and our neighborhoods and our friends and our city that has so much brokenness in it that we actually add to the goodness of the world. We start living the stuff we sang of you are good, God. I'm going to be so full of you. I'm going to be good into the world. I'm not going to add to the polarization. I'm not going to add to the division. I'm not going to add to the broken. I want to begin to add goodness to the world by you flowing through me. Jesus identifies with your story so that you can join his story. You say, well, how do I join his story? It's kind of interesting. This story right here of Jesus joining our story is actually a picture of how we join his story. Like, so one of the things you do is you surrender your life to Jesus. You, you turn from whatever you're doing and you turn and just say, okay, I'm all in with you, Jesus. And you publicly uh, proclaim Christ and the way in the, in the Christian faith you publicly proclaim him is you get baptized. You do, you do what Jesus did. And you're baptized in water as a symbol that he's washed you on the inside. It's a symbol of you dying with Christ and you coming alive and being born again. You get water baptized. We baptize people every third Sunday of the month here at the Vineyard. We just kind of set that up as a rhythm for this year. Nobody signed up uh, today, but I went ahead and filled it, um, or had our volunteer team, we have some great volunteers after their small group on Thursdays, they fill it up every month, and uh, they filled it up and got it ready, and it's nice and warm, because um, I thought, you know what, a couple things, one, there may be folks that just, for whatever reason, the Spirit of God has a hold of your heart today, and the story of Jesus grabbed you, and you're like, I'm ready to make a public decision, like I belong to Jesus. So I have towels, we have, we have brand new t-shirts and shorts and swim trunks, like I'm ready, you know what I'm saying? Like we got some stuff in the back, like we're ready. If anybody just goes, I'm going to do this thing spontaneous. I don't think we've ever done that here at the Vineyard. It's like the spontaneous, yeah, I'm ready. Well, we did it one time. One time uh, the refuge was here and a guy just said, I'm ready to get baptized. And he jumped in, you know, whatever clothes he came with and drove home wet, you know. But today, we're making it a little easier. Uh, uh, so you might, you might be thinking, yeah, I want to get baptized today. I'm ready to do this. Or maybe it's the next time we, get, we do baptisms, you're ready. The next third Sunday of the month happens to be Easter this year. 
April 21st. And so maybe there's some friends or family you want here to witness to them about your public proclamation. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, He who believes in his heart that Jesus is the Christ died for his sins and rose from the dead. He who believes in his uh, heart those things and confesses with his mouth Jesus is Lord and publicly proclaims that. He who does that, they're saved. And so maybe there's some people here you want to hear that public proclamation of seeing that. So you could sign up for, for uh, Easter baptism. There's another reason I went ahead and had this put out, even though nobody signed up. Because the way we identify with Jesus is publicly proclaiming him, is to being baptized by him. Um, the other reason I put this up here is because I just thought, you know what? All of us have people in our lives that... that we feel for because of whatever they're going through. And we know like the answer for them is the love of God, the goodness of God that we sang about today. And it's like, I just want like that person to come to know Jesus. I want you to do something right now. Just begin to ask God who in your life needs Jesus in this relationship with Jesus, needs to join his story. I just want you to imagine yourself talking to them about Jesus, sharing your faith, and one day you standing up here and you baptizing them as they give their life to Christ. Like, who, who in your life? Like, it's not going to be just counseling or just a doctor's visit or a better job or a better friendship or a better marriage. Like, who in your life, you just know the core issue is and they need to get right with God. And they just need to know that God loves them and accepts them and begin to live the way Jesus calls them to live. Like, who in your life is, is that person? And imagine them here. And you baptizing them. Just imagine that. There's another way you join the mission of Jesus, the story of Jesus. And, the, you know, he identified with your story so that you could identify with his and join his story. How do you do that? One of the ways you publicly proclaim him, you surrender your life to him, you make him Lord and King of your life, and then you publicly display that by getting baptized. Um, the other thing we need, I mean, most, a lot of people in the room have probably already been baptized, I'm guessing. Um, uh, the other way is, remember, John said... I do the water baptism. Somebody else is coming that doesn't just do water baptism. He baptizes with spirit and with fire. And remember I said their expectation was the fire was coming to, to uh, toast people, right? Like, <laughs> but in this age of grace and mercy, Jesus brings his Holy Spirit, which is a fire. And yes, it does burn. His presence burns away the things in our life that are selfish and hurtful to ourselves and hurtful to others and hurtful to our relationship with God. So there is a burning there. But more than a burning, it's a fire of empowerment. It's not a fire to, as I said earlier, smite people. We used to sing this song here in church, uh, fire fall down. You remember that? Fire fall down, fire fall down, fire fall down, I pray, something like that. Um, Emmy, our 13-year-old, was much younger when we were singing that song, and she wouldn't sing it, and we noticed that she wouldn't sing it, and she looked like this, and so we got in the car one day, and we're talking about the song, and she goes, I don't like that song. I don't want fire come down. She had like a fear when she was little, because I kind of, a little pyromaniac, uh, and so I would, I had stumps in the backyard that I didn't get a grinder for, and I just would drill holes in them, pour oil and gasoline in them, light them up, and somehow that scarred her, just me lighting things on fire, and... Um, <laughs> She would not sing Fire Fall Down because she, all she could picture is Fire Fall Down. Woof, there it is. No more, no more Emmy. You know. um, and uh, that's not the kind of fire we're talking about. I have no doubt God can do that kind of fire if he wants to do that fire. I have no doubt when Jesus returns, there will be a separation of the righteous and the unrighteous, the good and the evil. I get that. I'm, I'm for it, whatever. But now in this age of grace, there is a fire that comes when we are baptized and we're filled with the Holy Spirit that empowers us to live how Jesus would want us to live. You want to know why we have so little effect on the world? It's because I think most of us have such a thin worldview of what it means to be a Christian. If we're saved, we talk about it in past and future tenses. We talk about it as, I got saved, which is in the past, or we talk about, I can't wait to go to heaven, which is in the future, 
But God has a plan for your life now, and it's to be filled with the Holy Spirit and you walking and living and being personally transformed by the presence of God in you, you hearing his voice, you being empowered to battle the hurts, habits, and hang-ups that are in your life and to battle the sins that beset you, to be a transformed person, and you're empowered then through his Holy Spirit to then begin to transform the world, to do good in the world that actually makes a real impact in people's lives. That happens through the Holy Spirit. I mean, here's the deal, man. For goodness sakes, if Jesus needed the Holy Spirit, like how much more do you and I need the Holy Spirit? Right? I mean, if he had, if the human part of him needed him, he's sinless. He's like 100% human, 100% God. He's got a leg up on all of us, right? But yet the human part still needed empowered by the Holy Spirit in order to do the mission of God on the planet. If he needed that, how much more do you and I need baptized in the Holy Spirit? To have a sense that the presence of God is filling my soul right now and empowering me to be the kind of husband I need to be, to be the kind of dad I need to be, to be the kind of friend I need to be, to be the kind of follower of Jesus I need to be, the kind of neighbor, the kind of cousin, the kind of uncle, all that, all the things I do, the kind of worker, the kind of employee, all those things, the kind of leader. Like, we need the presence of God to empower us to be who Jesus wants us to be. And as the early church 2,000 years ago can testify, it's not a one and done thing. It's not like, man, I remember back in 1978, I, you know, I had this goose bump, I think it was God, and there was a hair on the back of my neck stood up, and okay, that's awesome, but I don't know about you, but I've done a lot of stuff since 1978, and I need more than that, you know? So the early church would talk about a continual filling of the Holy Spirit as they would worship, as they would give thanks, as they would submit to one another, as they'd love one another, as they would receive prayer and ask one another to lay hands on, just say, would you pray for me to receive a new filling of the Holy Spirit? And they're like us. They knew they needed that constant filling because they leak. (laughs) You ever leak the Holy Spirit? Like one day you feel real close to God Next day, you're, you know, cussing out the guy driving next to you, and, you know, you have a bad day at work and thinking hateful thoughts about the next guy. You think, if I could just take this pen and stab him through the eye. You know, like, well, maybe you've leaked the presence of God between then and, you know, I don't know. That, that, you might need another filling of the Holy Spirit, you know. I always picture it because I'm older, and I picture like Tom and Jerry. Remember when Tom and Jerry, they'd be running around the house, and Tom would step on a rake, and it hit him, and they'd drink a glass of water. And he'd, that's what I always, like, that's me in my life. I got these holes, and I get the Holy Spirit, and I feel great, but I got some holes that it just leaks out. So I need constantly filled with the Holy Spirit. 